had a crash in March. I hit my head. It has changed the course of, of my life and has changed the course of my career. He asked me, Gretchen, what am I supposed to do? Like, what, a, what am I supposed to do now? I mean, I wanted to race the Tour de France. From the age of 10, when I first watched the Tour on TV, that was where I wanted to be, and that's what I wanted to do. In those months following the crash, when I wasn't able to ride, um, I felt like I lost my identity a bit. And to realize that I've worked for you know the entirety of my adult life towards this one thing, riding a bike and being you know as fast as I can possibly be on a bike, and that was all taken away from me. Um, that was a scary thought, and that was something I really, I really struggled with. I'm sitting here now at my house in Vermont in mid-December 2019 and entering a new phase of my life and the transition into something completely different for me. Yeah, well I would say like the moment from January 2019 until June 2021 it's been a long time. And you know, when I retired from professional road race and I had this incredible amount of time without any competitive cycling. And I was still had this professional mentality where it's, you know, you're having fun, but like there's still this sense in your mind of like, all right, I gotta race, I gotta win. And then the pandemic came and I had this year without like any specific like race objective. And that was the first time I'd experienced that since I was like 12 years old a lot shifted in me internally that I realized that riding bikes is something incredibly valuable in my life and important and fun and I still love riding hard and you know these events started for fun it's about the whole experience you know last night we jumped on our bikes and we cruised around town you know and had fun. you would never do that in the world tour you know to kind of get back to the enjoyment of of cycling where you connect with people and it's about talking to people and you know there's so much shared experience and I can learn as much from you know someone who's done this race 10 times but never finished under 15 hours as they can learn from me and it's you know this contrast of lives and you know cycling experience is kind of all coming together in in one realm of cycling and that's gravel racing. What would it mean to me if I won? Um, I don't know. If I won the race, I don't think, well, I don't know. I haven't thought about winning or if I won, what it would mean. Um, oh, morning Ansel. You missed the first shot, but got a second one. It is 4.15. Yeah, woke up and decided to come down here and get to the machine before anyone else got to it. Yeah, I actually slept really well. Um, it's funny, the, the contrast between now and uh, yeah, an hour and 45 minutes, it's gonna be chaos on, on the gravel road. The start of the race was the first time I'd been in a group of that size in a long time. And it was sketchy, but it wasn't as crazy as I thought it would be. You know, I looked back a couple points where they make a turn and just see, like, as far as you could see, just riders stretched out. Um, once we got to, like, the unmaintained sections, it got a little bit more hairy and people were just bombing downhills trying to catch up. You feel the energy 
in that in that group, but I was very happy as it slowly started dwindling down and just, I mean, the first I guess, 70 miles was just a race of almost attrition, even though it was less than half the race. It just seemed like every, you know, every 10 or 15 miles, the group would just get smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where we had, I think, 12 people coming into the first aid station at mile 65. And uh, from there, Strickland came up to me and said, dude, I think a lot of people are hurting. And I was like, all right, let's, let's hit them. And so we came up this little roller and uh, I actually like pushed the pace and Robin Carpenter came with me. So we had a group of eight or so um, heading into that little Egypt section. And so that's where like kind of the final selection of five was made was through, was through little Egypt. And yeah, and then we hit, the, we hit the open road. And by that point we had, you know, probably five of the most, I won't say the strongest necessarily, but like the five most willing to, to work cohesively together. And we pretty much rolled for the next 100 miles, the, the five of us. People tried different moves at different times and tried to push the pace. But to realize that like everyone was almost so evenly matched, but no one had enough to actually get away. And so it wasn't until the last 30 miles that Pete attacked and Ten Dam went over the top of him and then I chased both those guys. Ted was behind, Colin got a bit distanced. And then Pete had a mechanical trying to go across to Lawrence and Ted came back up to us. But he was pretty fried by that point. You know, and all day I was kind of like doing these, not calculations, it was like, cool, there's 10 guys, I'll be top 10. Like, oh, there's five guys, I'll be top five. There's two of us, I'll be top two. And then to actually win, it wasn't really until I crossed the line, or really right before the line when I sprinted and realized that Lawrence wasn't gonna come around me. Then I was like, oh shit, <laughs> I just won this thing. And I mean, honestly, I had, really did not expect to win. Anyone in that group, I would have been happy to have won the race. You know, that was such a cool experience to just roll with those guys for so long. And just to have that sense of camaraderie and, you know, it's not savage like road racing can be and that we all wanted to, you know, help each other out until it became time to, to fight for the win. It makes no I mean, still a bit just overwhelmed by the magnitude of, of Unbound and how impactful this race is. And I knew that it kind of defined some riders' careers. I didn't honestly realize until winning just how much media attention is on this race. But having done it now and like just been through the process of you know starting at sunrise and you know seeing the course and like you know just hanging out with people after the event, I, I see why this is such a cool race and why people travel from around the world to come here. And it's awesome to just see the growth of, of this kind of sport in the US and how much it means to not only you know the cycling world but really to the communities. To have a small town like Emporia host you know over five thousand people for a bike ride is is mind boggling. Next frontier for me. And I always told myself if I wanted belt buckle, I would stop. But I don't know. I, uh, I have the belt buckle now, but I don't know if I want to stop. To be honest, like I'm definitely not as fit as I used to be when I was racing on the road. But on a single day in one event, I can still hold my own. Really, I want to say thanks to the people, you know, those five riders that I was with, you know, Pete Stetna, Colin Strickland, Lawrence Tandam, and Ted King, you know, to ride with those five, you know, really legends of, of the sport. You know, that was such a cool experience. Um, something I'd love to do again with, with those riders and, and plenty more. The Cowboys gathered Done? Done. Nice. Can I share a secret? None of you will tell. Um, my wife is pregnant. So we're going to be, uh, she's going to be giving birth in December. So that's my next frontier is being a father and seeing if I can, yeah, 
we'll see what that allows me to do as far as uh, <laughs> bike riding. But uh, yep, next chapter, next frontier, dad life. Dad bod. <laughs> it's a real thing. Man. It makes no difference.